Okay, now it should. It be. Is. Okay, there we go. Now it says it's recording. Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, well, I have, have eleven oh one, and I know Brendan is on a tight schedule today, so um, I'll Let's call the it. meeting to order. Um, first order of business, I want to welcome Stan Diamond to the board. Stan, Thank thanks you. for joining, and um, hopefully it'll be informative, and we'll keep you busy. So what I'm looking for. Oh, good. So you can be president, you can be chair, vice chair, and secretary if you'd like, Stan. No, thanks. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> okay, um, we'll begin with approval of the minutes from the last meeting. Are there any, um, you should have all received a copy from Joe. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? Nothing on my end. Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So I'm moved. Second. A second. Uh, second, Joe. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor of approving the minutes? Just a wave is good. Thank you. And Stan, we'll have Stan abstention, if you will. Perfect. Uh, public speak. Is there anyone out there, Brendan? Uh, no. I well, hold on. Someone just. Oh, this is Louise right here. Um, but I don't think I see anybody else. No. Okay, great. Uh, Louise, I don't know if you can hear me, but um, we've only uh, reached the public speak part. Um, we had enough people for a quorum, so we just started because um, we're kind of on a tight timeline. <clears throat> And Louise, um, if you're taking minutes, um, the minutes were approved with a motion from Chuck and a second from Joe. Uh, um, yeah, I forgot. I've had a lot of trouble with the um, city website. I forgot you said to use yours instead just because I forgot it first. And yeah. yeah. Um, I had a comment about the minutes, but... Okay. Um, I guess that's passed now. Um, yeah, we've already approved the minutes, but if there's something you want us to go back and correct or add? Yeah, there's a comment, and I can't find it now, but I mean, I really, <laughs> anyway. Um, it better be good. to Jay as an outsider under the question, and then saying that I also thought that, um, Suggested. I wish I could find it. Uh, that would probably be helpful. Yeah, I'm sorry. I had this set up on a different device and. That's the agenda, not the minutes. Um, Okay, we could come back to that, Louise. Um, now, that would be fastest because... Yeah, yeah, we'll come back to it. And you're going to take minutes for this meeting, Louise? I am. Give me one second because, again, I think the city website is having its own problem, too. Um, and I know they're moving things. Okay, I am ready. So the minutes were... And, I, and this has been recorded, right? That's correct. Meeting is yeah. being recorded. So I can always check it out. So as Joe pointed out, you can always go back and look at the recording if you need anything to add to the minutes. So uh, exactly. we'll the meeting to order. Uh, we welcome Stan as a new member to okay. the EOA board. And we approve the minutes with a motion from Chuck and a second from Joe. And just to be technical, Stan abstained from the minutes, seeing he was not here for that meeting. Uh, there was no one for public speak, so we're at the uh, number four, the financial report. So oh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, nothing to report on my end. Of course, you guys can take a, a look. If you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer. Um, 
but yeah, uh, our overall percentage uh, with our, we're at 71.48 as you can see in the corner here. Um, but yeah, moving along. So we're in good shape with only two months left to go in the fiscal year? Yep. Perfect. Um, so can I have a motion to accept the financial report? I'll make a motion. Thanks, Pat. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, Chuck beat you to it, Joe. All right. So motion is made by Pat and seconded by Chuck to approve the financial report. Any further discussion? All in favor? Just a wave is fine. Good. Thank you all very much. Highland Valley report. Uh, Pat. Um, they're plugging along. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, information going on. I think actually a meeting is next week. So at the moment, I don't have anything to add. Okay. No, I, I lied. It's not next week. It's a couple weeks. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll get an update from you at our next meeting. Yep. Uh, senior tax work off. I think I'm going to call on Joe for that. Yeah. I've just put it up. Instead of continuing to put in old business, just like our Highland Valley report, if we need to report on something, we'll just have it. Instead of being always in the old business, it'll be on the, the top part of the agenda. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Do you, uh, do you want me to just talk about what's going on? Yeah, yeah maybe sure. an update, Joe. Sure. Uh, we had a, uh, <clears throat> the, the members are, are the, the members of the subcommittee, the, the tax work off subcommittee of the Council on Aging Board uh, had a Zoom meeting with the, uh, the members of the, uh, the senior tax work off committee, the city council level one with Peg and, uh, Peg and JP, and basically just brought them up to speed on where we are. Uh, long story short is we appear to be in pretty good situation in terms of going out to the uh, department heads and getting uh, position descriptions written. And I've got three that I've worked on and Brendan said that he's got a number, I think four is maybe four or five or something. Yeah, so I have uh, five right now with actually two pending. The health department just reached out to me this morning about okay. positions. So um, I'm gonna work with that and see. I, I'm not sure if they can quite hit the 113 hours with the work that they have. Right. But I'm also trying to be mindful that their department is under a lot of pressure right now to, you know, and, and they've picked up some extra employees, but I'm trying to be mindful of, of what they have to do in the health department, given our circumstances. Okay. Uh, I guess the long story short is in terms of the number of positions from 8 to 12, we appear to be in pretty good shape. And what we asked uh, the one thing that I think we probably need to spend some time uh, working is how do we uh, make the program known to the citizens of the city and how do we, uh, you know, in preparation for people starting to apply for uh, the program. And uh, that's what we talked to, uh, to Peg and, uh, and the, other, the other folks about. And the long, what I understand from there is, uh, you know, we will provide some information to Peg and then she will turn it over to a number of different people who were mentioned who may be in a position to put together the marketing piece of it, uh, getting the word out to the citizens of the potential volunteers and to the citizens at large. Um, that's where we are working right now. And, uh, and then we also talked a little bit about the financial uh, vetting that uh, Jen uh, will do from the um, from the treasurer's office, I believe. And uh, but that that will be down the road a little bit. Once we have volunteers coming on board, then they'll have to be financially vetted. But uh, I think we have a fair chunk of work ahead of us. But uh, I don't see it as being uh, overwhelming by any means. Uh, Brendan? Uh, Louise has her hand raised, so I, uh, if you want to go ahead, Louise. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Brendan. I'm going to lower too. Yeah, I just have, you said, Peg, um, 
we'll turn it over to marketing people. Who are these? Or what areas do they represent? Stan, would you care to uh, care to jump in on that one? Sure. Um, at that meeting, I suggested that we might want to reach out to uh, Amy Rist. Um, she used to be doing marketing for East Hampton Neighbors. And there has been a fallout in that organization, and she is not. She resigned last week. She would be a good person to do, to work up a marketing program if people want to do that. Uh, the other place that I suggested to reach out to is to Jen Ramsey at East Hampton Media, uh, so that they can start thinking about creating. Uh, PSA announcements that they could tag on to their, you know, various meeting videos for people to see. Okay, if I could comment, two, two suggestions. I think those are great. They cover a certain portion of seniors. They won't recall. Um, one Facebook, and I know the city, um, the mayor dislikes Facebook and is well known not to be on it, but you're going to reach seniors that you're not going, who aren't on television, so they're not going to, who don't have television, so you, they're not going to see this. And I'm not sure Amy's work, she, um, you know, East Hampton Neighbors has not gained traction publicity-wise in East Hampton yet. Um, I think she's, I, I think they're covering two areas, but, um, people are fragmented. They all don't do the same. So, um, one would be, or somebody can just pick it up. I can, anybody can, and just do a few posts that'll reach people who aren't reached. And my other question, and Brendan, this might be something for another time, but this would be I don't know how much access we have to the city alert program. Oh, actually, I think um, someone had mentioned that at our last meeting um, to actually touch base with Lindsay Mailer because she's the one who pretty much runs the city alert. Um, so I, I can follow up with Lindsay about that. Because it could even just be this is available. It might piggyback several things are available and here's where you go. Yeah, and the other thing that I had mentioned too, and it, it gets kind of tricky because our current software, anybody, we can send out a PSA, but it's only to the people that we've had direct contact with. But I think that might be another thing to also um, put into the mix along with East Hampton Media um, and then Lindsay Mailer, uh, City Alert System, and, and so forth. Great. I think too, Louise, what, what Stan and Joe highlighted here was was um, probably 90% of the of the marketing PSA reaching out, if you will, to seniors. But there were also other suggestions that came out at that meeting. For example, I think Brendan said he could put something in the COA newsletter. Uh, we talked about reaching out to the Gazette to have them do an article, a follow-up article. They did an article originally when the city adopted the program, but now when it's getting close to up and running, um, you know, we would love to have them do an article that would, you know, say we're looking for participants, if you will. Um, so there's going to be a lot of different marketing angles to get the word out. That is the um, the goal now, as as Joe said, the the committee's done a pretty good job, a really good job of identifying positions. Now we need to match the skills and. You know, in the in the end, the seniors get a chance to have up to a fifteen hundred dollar reduction in their annual tax bill. Pat, I think I had thrown your name out as possibly getting the word out on Facebook. So once once Amy Risk gets that developed, I mean, she's on Facebook too. Mm -hmm. But um, you've got you've got more friends, Pat, than the resident total population of East Hampton. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> anybody who gets the word out on Facebook and shares it, once that PSA is developed. Um, again, it, it doesn't do us a lot of good with the program until we get participants and, and seeing actual success stories in, um, in, in getting a tax reduction for the seniors. One, one other thing that I thought was, was pretty um, supportive, if you will, when Brendan sent out the request to the city departments 
asking them to identify positions where they could use senior volunteers. Within seconds of that going out, the mayor sent out a follow-up encouraging all the city department heads to dig deep and find places where they could get some jobs done in their departments that they might not otherwise be able to get done. So um, I think this could be a real home run for the city. Tom, one other question. Yes. Um, it was discussed last month, I'm afraid I forgot. Are, um, are these positions remote, in person, both? I'm guessing they're going to be in person. Um, you know, some departments are talking about filing, um, park and rec. You know, some some might be doing some work up up in the park in the summertime. Um, I think That's Barbara Labombard had talked about record retention work. Um, Joe, you might have a handle on what some of the other positions or, or Brendan. Yeah, I, I mean, I will say this. Um, I know the police department, the position that they're looking at, they want Joe, they said they wanted people, the, the volunteer to actually be on site, right? Uh, um, that's that's uh, one of the positions from the police department is a crossing guard. So yes, uh, someone yeah. will have to be on site for that. Yeah. All kind of weather. <laughs> yeah, and then the the clerical ass assistant position even still I think there's a talking. clerical one yeah and I think they want that on site too. And I think their theory is, um, you know, everybody in public safety has been fully vaccinated, um, and at, you know, at this point in July, city hall will open up. Um, and granted, it's based on uh, reserving times with any given department that you have, but this is part of the reopening. So in July, you know, people will be on site and I'm sure they'll make accommodations to make sure that everybody is, you know, appropriately, you know, that there's social distancing is being observed and that people are wearing masks when they're on site. Okay, I hear you. Given that it's seniors, I would just throw out, it would, and given that we don't know how variants are going to go, um, especially, mm -hmm. it would be nice if we answer that question in the publicity mm -hmm. and maybe if we tried to negotiate a few of the positions that had um, remote options for them. I mean, some of these crossing guard, you know, they're outside, so that covers it, but um, it would be nice to offer a few of those as well, at least for the next year or so or until. Yeah. And we can we can definitely ask them to look at that, Louise. My guess is right now that 90% of these positions are going to be in person um, just because of the nature of the beast. Um, but again, it, to Brendan's point, City Hall may be open, but, you know, they're working with limited staff, limited customer interaction. So I, I don't see these people having to be around a lot of other people. Um, just one other thought, Joe and Brendan, about marketing is, you know, we you look at people that have a large base of seniors as customers. Um, I'm thinking of the banks, uh, potentially think at Paris. Um, we could ask businesses to put this out on their own websites as a short PSA statement, reminding them of the availability of this program. Could be. You don't qualify yet, Pat, but... Uh, the, the other thing we can do as board members is whenever we see a PSA that somebody posts that we think is good, we can always repost it and get it seen by more eyes. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Joe, Brendan, thank right. you very much for the update. Sure. Um, we do have a, a meeting that Brendan's trying to put together with the um, personnel director. Um, the, the only other piece here we're trying to figure out is the, um, the the process. So when someone applies, what's the process the city wants them to go through? Because I believe technically, Joe, if I'm correct, they actually become a city employee technically on paper. Yeah. So um, what's mm -hmm. the process the city wants these people to go through from beginning to end when it comes to application, to interview, Corey check, hiring, and uh, Emily, who is the I believe personnel director will will guide us through that process. Okay, uh, Joe. Do, do we have any indication of when Emily might be ready to meet on that? Uh, she hasn't responded to that email yet, so I'm gonna have to probably just uh, follow up with her again. Uh, okay. 
you know, I, and, and I, like I tried to say, you know, I, I certainly, I know that she has a new assistant and things are a little bit easier there, but they're still playing catch up with, uh, when they had a gap, um, when wait, when Emily was waiting to get approved, uh, as personnel director. Um, so, but yeah, so I, I, we're, you know, I think we can make this easy for personnel. I just need to get some of that guidance. And so I'll follow up with Emily again today. Okay. Thanks, Brendan. <laughs> Okay, um, moving on to executive director's report. All right, um, so uh, March 26th, I met with Nancy Mathers from Highland Valley Elder Services. She's the new program director there, and we were able to secure a third day finally. Um, I, I you know, was struggling getting in touch with her. Um, she was on vacation last month, but I finally bumped into her on March 26th. And so now, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays will be our uh, meal days. So I just want to keep people updated on that. Um, we consider it a valuable service, and we want to keep on offering it. And you know, as I've mentioned in previous meetings, um, it's clear that we're not, even when we do reopen, we're not going to be having meals here on site. It's just, I don't think it's appropriate given the population that we're serving. So we'll continue to offer a grab and go um, and then I think when we do reopen when we get the official approval for that we'll have uh, you know classes that people have to register for in advance and we'll only be open for those events and not you know open doors so the meals it's gonna be a while um, I anticipate before we do anything back here um, in the center um, so but we'll keep going with the grab and go meals and we hope that you know we keep on having the same consistent numbers that we have been and um, you know it's something that we uh, certainly love to do. Um, it's our chance to connect with a lot of people that we haven't seen in some time. And even though it's for a brief period of time in the back parking lot of 50 Pace, and it's still it's still a great thing to have touch, like actual you know contact with someone instead of you know being on Zoom or you know whatever. But so I just want to update you guys on that. Uh, the after April 28th, uh, municipal employees are no longer eligible for testing at Williston Academy. Um, I just want to point out that I think the health department uh, and the mayor's office did a pretty amazing job at this. This was something that was really helpful because uh, while we're fully vaccinated now here at the department um, with the Council on Aging, we were kind of in this waiting period. Um, some of us didn't come in until you know a certain part of phase two, so having that weekly test was nice but now it's actually perfect timing we're closing out the testing and all of us at this point will be fully vaccinated around this time but it was a huge help um, during those periods when we didn't have the vaccine available to us so um, I just wanted to point that out and it was a uh, you know just an extra while well, we all have our own office spaces here and we've all been reporting to work um, you know it's just nice to have that in the mix because there were times where we weren't sure when we would get the vaccine so yeah, I don't. I don't think that that has uh, has been seen or or that a lot of the public know that Wilson was doing that. I, I think it's it was a great op, you know it was a great way to partner, and I think it also helped for folks like you, Brendan, who if you were exposed, you didn't have to go to Holyoke Community College and wait three hours in line to get a test. You were able to get a test pretty quickly and get the results pretty quickly, and and I know they did that for all the whole, you know, most of the departments in the city. So it's unfortunate that that didn't get a, a little more um, play, I guess. Is the, not, that's not the right word either, but it, it's a great that to know that they were a partner in this, uh, in this event, you know. Yeah, great. Yeah, and, and while we do mostly dropping off of food or, you know, like people come to pick up food at 50 Payson, there are times where we've had to go in um, with situations where, you know, like uh, just last week, I was in someone's house, um, you know, and they're having yeah. a major issue with their place being condemned. And so, you know, sometimes we have to be out there working with either the health department or Highland Valley Elder Services. So while we try to limit home visits, it still happens from time yeah. to time where we have to be out in the yeah. field when there's nothing else that we can do. I mean, we can't you know, do some of this stuff remotely. So I feel like this is a, a great transitional period. You know, while we don't have the testing anymore, now we're fully vaccinated. And the first round, of course, being our van drivers, given the space that they're in. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so I just wanted to give a shout out to Bree and, and the health department and the mayor's office for making that available because it was something that we could always yeah. rely on. And we got 24 hour turnaround. We didn't have right. to wait for a two day uh, turnaround, like some or even more. Uh, yeah. 
if you went to like Holyoke Community College or some of these other sites. Yeah. I'm hoping, Pat, that along the lines of your comment that the, the folks in government, city council, school, I, I'm hoping all those folks know that happened. And because those are the folks that usually hear the, um, you know, when there tends to be a silent, a, 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 sort of a behind the scenes uproar about Williston and taxes, yeah. what have you. Um, sometimes we forget all of the benefits that, that they do provide to the community. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm hoping that all of the powers that be in city government are aware of their contribution and assistance through that process. Yeah. Even, even if the general public isn't aware of it. Yeah, yeah, I think they are, but that's that's a good point. Probably the um, gen they're more aware than the general public. Yes. But having by long shot, having said that, um, I had just going back to the meals, the um, continuing Brendan. Um, does COA do we deliver to anybody who can't get there? Are you? aware of anybody who can't do their pickups? There have been a couple of volunteers from the neighbors who've helped us out. Um, and technically, uh, if someone can't make it to the site, Highland Valley wants us to refer them to the Meals on Wheels program because they feel like that's an appropriate fit. Um, but we do know that we've had a couple of people, you know, whether it's just a bad day for them or they're not feeling so great and they can't make it out. We've had some volunteers run it, but if it's something that needs to be done consistently, Highland Valley has urged us to refer them over to Meals on Wheels program. Stan? Yeah, um, I don't have a lot of detail on this, but I saw a notice uh, this morning, actually, that Walgreens was going to be supporting PCR, free PCR testing as part of the national initiative to identify variants. Mm -hmm. Um, we may be able to tie into that if some of the local Walgreens are doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, other, the other possibility is I used to work at the Broad Institute for Genome Research in Boston, in Cambridge, and they have been doing, they have been ramping up, you know, phenomenally to do fast turnaround testing for all of the various kinds of tests. And we may be able to work out something with them where they can provide us with do-it-yourself test kits that we could give out to people or we can help supply the, uh, the city health department um, where people could, might be able to get these tests done you know, in their home or locally. That's great ideas, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stan. All right. Um, so I just wanted to, I know that I've talked about this on a couple of different occasions, but the House of Ways and Means Committee uh, is releasing a proposed version for the FY22 budget, um, and that was last Wednesday, obviously, um, and that they'll be following uh, with the full House debate on the 26th. So. MCOA has kind of looked at the numbers and there may be some delays in the 2020 census, but if things do pan out the way they're supposed to, um, UMass had done a study where they think that it's gonna be an additional 450,000 seniors who are merging into the 60 plus uh, population. So after looking at those numbers, this would represent a 30% increase um, just for this one line item for our local aid. Um, I doubt the state's gonna bite or you know take that on. Um, I, I can see there being cuts, but still um, the MCOA and other advocates are approaching this from the frame of mind. Let's do a staggered approach. Um, and so what they're asking for and, and time will only tell is that um, they proceed as they had in FY02 and FY12 by ratcheting back formula rate. So we would go from, you know, potentially $12 senior down to 11 or 10 and then rebuild over the next fiscal year up to the 12. Um, as I've mentioned before, even if we do get low balled on the uh, formula grant 
um, at nine dollars. I mean, the only time if if there are delays in the U.S. Uh, census, this is where we'll get hurt if we are still working off the 2010 at nine dollars per senior. Um, but if they can manage to do this staggered approach, and we have the numbers that we do um, from the 2020 census, even if it was at nine dollars per senior, we're still faring out a little bit better than we are this year. So, time will tell. Um, I mean, this is in the very beginning process. We didn't find out this fiscal year's uh, OEA budget until, oh my goodness, I want to say it was probably November, December of last year. So it gets tricky and certainly um, we hope that the 2020 um, will come through because if not, and we're still working off the 2010 census, it's going to be a little bit of a impact for us. So, so yeah. Um, all right. So as far as new business goes, um, the Council on Aging is collaborating with CESA again this year to offer another farm share from Park Hill Orchards. Um, the suggestion that from CESA is that we, you know, change it from five households and double up and, and try to hit 10 or more households, um, but without increasing the grant money. So my thought is, is that we may try to match what they give to Park Hill Orchard to really make sure that we're not, that we're getting substantial shares. Um, I think so far CISA has put over something to the tune of seven or $800 for the farm share. And um, I think that's something, if we can match, then we double the households. Um, and as you can see here, uh, the qualifications that CISA has lined up for us is that the individual has has to be 60 years of age or older. Uh, they have to qualify for one or more of the following programs listed below here, whether it's SNAP, Medicaid, SSI, you name it, um, food bank, uh, or if they live alone and they're below the income of 25,760. Um, so these are the parameters that we're working with, and um, we, we hope that with us matching it, we can hit even more households. So um, that's just coming up here. And the applications will be due by June 1st. So uh, we will be putting it up on social media. We have it in our newsletter for May. Uh, so we'll see where that takes off. But it's a, a great program. Park Hill Orchards has participated in this for the last couple of years. And they just offer exceptional fruit share. You know, it's just, you know, some of the highest quality, you know, and it's right here in our backyard. So it's great to support a local farmer with grant money and also be able to give our folks a uh, decent fruit share. It's great. All right. Um, so the Johnson & Johnson fiasco. <laughs> um, we, right before this broke on April 12th, we had registered a handful of people um, over a weekend clinic. And then, of course, we had people set up for last Wednesday. I got a lot of panicked phone calls um, right now, and I'm certainly not a medical expert, but um, from what I can see uh, out of the six point something million, um, the six instances where there was hemorrhaging as a result from getting the vaccine, I mean, these are, you know, people in the ages between 18 and 48. Um, we are, as I've mentioned in the report, we will be following up with those individuals who did receive the Johnson & Johnson, just so that they're aware um, that this is something that the CDC is monitoring. Uh, but I don't think that it's going to impact, and again, I'm not a medical professional, but I, I don't think this will have any impact. But I know a lot of people are concerned about it. We got plenty of phone calls. Um, but again, we'll follow up with them. But I, I don't anticipate this being an issue. And then I only, oh, Stan, go ahead. Well, uh, on that same topic, you know, from what I've been reading is that the, uh, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are having very similar numbers of this particular response to the vaccine. I, th I think the J&J uh, &J was seven out of total, the uh, oh, seven per 100,000, whatever it is. And the other two are like four or five per 100, you know, uh, you know in the same quantities. Um, and also, it, it's highly unlikely that this will be extensive because I think it's, I think the chance of getting this uh, side effect from the J&J &J vaccine even is smaller than the chance of getting struck by lightning. Right. Yeah. Uh, Joe, you had your hand raised? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, let me uh, lower the hand. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was the uh, AstraZeneca 
that's had uh, where a number of people have had, I think up to 30 have had similar issues with not hemorrhaging, but clotting. Oh, um, right. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, but, but when we look at the uh, when we look at the percentage of occurrence, and especially with the JOJ, J and J, it's something like six people out of, you know, like, I don't know how many, four million or something like that. So percentage wise, it's really Seven. small. <laughs> Yeah, so, and Stan's absolutely right. It's, you know, the chances are better of you getting hit by lightning than this right. happening. And apparently it's only women of uh, younger and middle age right. where uh, among the six people who have experienced this. So I, I mean, yeah, I can understand you're getting a lot of phone calls because people hear it on TV or the media, they get worried right away. But realistically, I think it's... Uh, you know, next to a non-issue. I hope, you know, and, and one thing that I've seen, at least on my end, is I find that a lot of people were interested in getting the vaccine, and I really hope that this doesn't create vaccine hesitancy, um, because we were on a, a pretty solid roll. Um, and the thing is, is that Johnson & Johnson, out of all the registrations we've done, I mean, it's rare when it comes up, but it just so happened that right before this broke, Northampton had a couple of clinics where that's all they were giving. Um, and I think that just comes down to distribution. I think that they take what they can get. And it just so happened that, you know, a few days prior to that, we had signed up a number of people from the Northampton Clinic where they were doing Johnson & Johnson. So, you know, uh, again, we'll be following up with these individuals, and I'm sure they're well aware of what's happening. Um, but it is something that has caused some concern for our folks. Brendan, I'll have to go back and um, try to find the story online, but I only caught this in passing, so um, I apologize if I don't have all the facts straight, but I, I could have sworn there was something on the news this morning about additional cases and problems with J&J &J, and that they were actually suspending production of their vaccine until they could check it. So, so I understand what Joe and Stan were saying. I think the numbers originally were like one per million or something, but I think I think they uncovered more cases in the past couple of days that's made them, made whoever, CDC, I guess, more concerned about restarting J&J &J here. And again, I apologize, I didn't catch the whole story, but there was something out this morning about J&J &J and more cases and them potentially pausing their production. Tom, they were they're pausing production anyway because of the production difficulties. Um, okay. In the in the Baltimore plant. Baltimore area, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that was a that was a problem looming even before they um, suspended the authorization for a week, which at least Fauci, who should know, thinks that they it will be reinstated Friday, this Friday, possibly with some sort of warning to women or to everybody 40 and under, which doesn't affect our rate, our age group. But then we're not going to have it for a few weeks or a month. So there's. So there's still going. I see you nodding, Brendan. So there's still going to be a um, from the vaccine angel side of it. It's still a mess. Yeah, Pat, Brendan. I just want to ask. Uh, so uh, with that, with that information, um, and ha have you seen a decrease in folks reaching out to you to help get the the vaccine? And and I guess I'm trying to just uh, keep on track of. Forget about J&J &J for a second, and let's keep the, the trying to help folks get vaccinated that want to. Have you seen a decrease in um, folks I, asking? Well, yeah. So if it hadn't been for the fact that we had um, certain access to the Northampton Clinic, um, I, I, I don't know how that would have turned out, but we got the majority of our people signed up for the Pfizer, mostly Pfizer, a couple of here and there out of the 250 or so that we did um, in the last few weeks. Um, most of it was Pfizer, maybe one or two Moderna. Um, so we've gone through our, our wait list. In fact, by the time the clinic opened up in Northampton uh, for the J&J, &J, uh, the only people we had left in the list really were people who specifically wanted it. So. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know what it would have been like if we were still 250 plus deep on the wait list and we weren't able 
look at those folks' vaccines, and then the story broke. I don't know how that would have played out, but um, so, we got through most of uh, people who were waiting. So, all right, so right now your wait list has been reduced to nothing. Yeah, and that's all okay. Miss Northampton has been coordinating through our health department. Okay. So it's just, it's been a huge, you know, relief for us to be able to have access to this and not compete with a million other people trying right. to. Right, right. Yeah, and I think the city's um, update that they're doing, and I thought it had a breakdown of uh, of age where everyone was in the vaccine process. I just don't remember what those numbers were off the top of my head, but I'm sure we can look those up or Bree can give us those. Like, what's the percentage of 55 and older that have been vaccinated in the city so far, just as a, from a number's sake, you know? Yeah, I haven't looked at the dashboard recently. Yeah, me either. So, yeah. all right, we can move on because I know you're getting short for time. We got about 10 minutes left. Yeah, yeah. So the, the last thing that I just wanted to mention here, and this has been a concern of mine for a while. Um, so I wanted to work with Barbara um, over at the city clerk uh, office because we have a bunch of inactive files that have been stored in our basement. And... Um, they're mostly outreach files, um, and according to retention uh, laws or record retention laws, we're supposed to we can hold on to them for three years, and then we can ask the state that they be destroyed. Um, we have to put in an application. I currently have my outreach worker going through the files right now, because in those boxes we've had, uh, you know, information like highly sensitive information that we just don't need to hold here. Um, so if the state is going to allow us to destroy it, then I am going to go through and clean out what I can. And we're in the process of doing that. And the reason why I think it's been a problem for me is because we have, you know, people's social security numbers. We have bank account information on people for when they've applied to something like Medicaid. Um, we have... You know, complaints that have come in through the health department that we've documented when we're trying to help people. Um, so there's a bunch of sensitive information in there that we just don't need to hold on to. Um, the other thing that we're going to be doing is taking a lot of these inactive files and upgrading them to our My Senior Center software um, just to know what we've done, not to necessarily hold on to any sensitive information. Um, but it is a process that we're beginning, and I think it's time. Um, and I, you know, when I met with uh, Barbara and then this company that they're working with here at the city uh, for records. Um, it seems like even if we were to be questioned, because I've had this happen before where a state department, such as the um, State Ethics Commission, has contacted us to follow up on something that happened some years ago, not necessarily with the COA, but they wanted to know what kind of connections we had with this particular person at a point in time. Um, they still can't hold us liable for that because as long as the state approves it, we have that retention uh, three years for outreach files, I want to destroy them and I don't want them hanging around. There's no reason for us to be sitting on that kind of information if we're no longer actively working with these individuals. So, um, but I, the process is actually going to be much easier than had anticipated. Um, only one application needs to go in. And so as long as we're in that three year period, we could submit it, and once we get the stamp of approval from the state, then we can destroy those records um, appropriately. So, Brendan, just one quick question. I, I think that's great that you're going to get rid of that old stuff, but um, will, will this will this application allow you to um, destroy three-year-old records on an ongoing basis, or will you have to apply each time you want to do it? Yeah. So. Um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to wrap up. We're going to take all of the boxes, all the outreach boxes that are downstairs, and we're going to use this one application. And then once we've eliminated this first round of three years, then we'll you know approach this again three years out from now, where we'll be looking at sending in the same application. But yeah, so it, it can be it'll be ongoing, obviously. So when we start pulling inactive files and putting them down in storage, um, you know we'll then begin the process of, of putting in an application for the destruction of those records okay great yeah. sorry oh, a bunch of noises in the okay back. we'll let you uh run through the may events real quick yeah um so we're back to doing tai chi classes outdoors parks and rec is allowing us to use that space um so we're you know we're excited about that uh lenny burlingame who is the tai chi uh, uh instructor is is back on board so we'll have space um, bathroom accessibility all of that stuff because it's going to be right over near where the swimming pool is almost and between the swimming pool and the uh the baseball field um it 
offers enough coverage, but I think one of the big problems that we had is that people just wanted to make sure that they had access to the bathroom. So we have that, and Parks and Rec has been working with us to make sure that that's available. Um, Starting in May, too, we also have one of our van drivers who's a biologist um, and has worked in the field uh, for some years uh, doing uh, nature walks. So, you know, this is something that we've talked to Bree about. Um, we've been a okay Obviously, we all have to face masks, social distancing, but I think we need to keep on encouraging outdoor events like this. Um, so the first one we'll be doing is over at the Arcadia Wildlife Sanctuary. Um, we have uh, decoupage candle holders with Clarissa. Now this is gonna be our first event that we're doing on site, but out in our back parking lot. I'm still working on trying to find uh, a tent that can you know, provide coverage from the sun. Although May 12th is pretty early. Um, I don't anticipate there being any really hot days, but you never know with New England. Um, one thing that's interesting about this, and again, this goes back to accessibility, um, we wanted to make sure that we had an outlet for people to use bathrooms. Um, and the mayor has approved us having people just come in to use the bathrooms and nothing more. Um, so this is our attempt. We're gonna see how an on-site uh, program goes. I, I really hope it works out, but we do have limited space here. Um, there's not much to work with, but I figured our back parking lot would be the easiest considering how there's an elevator over there. So if people need to get downstairs, um, they can do that and have accessibility, so. Um, we're also launching a, a walking club in May. Uh, our activity coordinator, uh, Don Gratian Moore, will be part of that. And then the last part is um, the Girl Scout troop uh, is, has actually built us a little free library. And so they're gonna be doing a ribbon cutting ceremony on May 5th. Um, the girls have done a wonderful job. Um, they had approached us looking for ways that they could help. And we had offered this because we have this space over here right near the PBTA. Um, so we just thought it would be a nice little addition to have in our yard. And the DPW is gonna be um, laying the foundation for that and we'll be doing the ribbon cutting ceremony. So I just wanted to give a shout out to the Girl Scout troop. They're doing an amazing job and it was a very sweet thing for them to offer us, so. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Brandon, can you let me know when that's going to happen, like the, yeah. the time yeah, and uh, stuff like that? Yeah, May 5th. I think it's at 4 o'clock. I'll double check on the time. Um, okay. Thanks. There for 4 o'clock, May 5th. All right. Thank you. All right. Does anybody have any questions for me? Um, Quick one, Brendan. Yeah. Your, you still have your in with NoHo Senior Center. I'm sorry, what about Northampton scenes? Back to back scenes. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't gotten a link this week yet, but they have been doing it consistently for the last four weeks. So you can contact them separately from the online res registration? They send us a link through email, which ends up over with Bree, and then she shares it with us so we can get through our wait list. Uh, because I've almost sent you people like three times in the last minute. What, what was that? I have almost sent you people three times in the last week or two because I'd heard. So I just want to know. If... Yeah, I mean, usually they drop this link to us usually either on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. Um, so I'm not sure when it's going to happen, but when we do, um, I can let you know. Okay, great. Yeah. I mean, right now they're cut between April 19th opening and the JJ, but assuming in a week or two, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep you updated for sure. Anything else? Hey, if there's nothing else for Brendan, um, I'm going to get you out of here a minute early, Brendan. Okay. I um, Our next meeting is scheduled for May 17th. Yep. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Thanks, Pat, and second by Stan. Sorry, Joe, we boxed you out again. That's fine. <laughs> I yield. Right, so Lisa, I just wanted to thank you for um, volunteering to step into uh, that position. Uh, I, I appreciate it. Yes. Agreed. Yep. We thanked you, Louise, before you actually got online this morning, but thank you, yes, for agreeing to take the minutes. <laughs> and if you have any questions or comments about it, you should have all the information that Joe sent out, but I'm sure you can contact Joe if you've got any questions about formatting it or what to do with the minutes. Tom. Of course, I'll send you the link, uh, Louise, so you can, you know, watch the video. If you have any questions, you can just review it. Okay, it's on um, East Hampton Media, isn't it? With you send it there. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I can send you the link though before probably East Hampton Media even gets it up. Gets it up, yeah. <laughs> hey, Tom, you said the 18th, right? For the next meeting, not the 17th, right? The 17th is what's. That's a Monday. That's a Monday. That's why I'm asking. Okay. Oh, geez. It'll be the 18th then. That's what I thought. That's what's on my calendar. That's why I was questioning it, whether I put it in the wrong spot. <laughs> the 18th. Okay. And uh, Pat, I have one quick question for you after we adjourn. Um, so all in favor of adjourn. Aye. 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 Thank you all very much. Thank you. All right. Pat, Take care, guys. Thank you guys very much. Pat, how are we picking up items from the Riverside auction? Just going oh. into one cottage? <clears throat> I haven't heard yet. I got to assume.